I am Bernard Herschel. Before my retirement, I was the chief of HIV AIDS at the Geneva University Hospitals. You may call me an AIDS dinosaur who has followed the AIDS epidemic from the very first cases in the early 1980s to the current era of one pill a day therapists, a triumph rarely equaled in the annals of medicine. This triumph has its flip side. Younger colleagues are no longer familiar with the opportunistic diseases of AIDS and their myriad manifestations. Hence the idea of these videos. They feature a series of images illustrating one or several exemplary case studies, mostly drawn from my files. Tuberculosis occurs in both immunosuppressed patients and in patients with a normal immune system. The presentation and progress of the disease differs, however. The first difference lies in the progression of primary TB infection. It is unusual for a primary infection to generalize in the presence of immunity, but in patients with HIV such a course was frequent. Our first patient was a young woman who came to our attention in 1989. Her tuberculin skin test was negative and she was not immunosuppressed with a CD4 count above 400. However, four years later, she had oral candidiasis and the CD4 count had to decrease to 45. In February 1994, after a trip to Thailand, she had fever and cough. And in March 1994, her physician did a chest X-ray on February 16, 1994. It is essentially normal. Five weeks later, however, can you spot what changed? There was a discrete infiltrate in the apex of the right lower lobe, which is a typical location for the so-called primary TB complex. It is well visible in the insert on the left. Bronchoscopy showed a nodule from which MTB was isolated. Unfortunately, MTB was a resistant to isoniazid and rifampicin. Despite treatment, the lesion cavitated. See the CT scan on the right. In this image, dated 20 months after the diagnosis of TB, the pre-existing cavity is partly filled in raising the question of Aspergillus superinfection. Although many treatments were tried, MTB could not be eradicated and the patient died in December 1996. The tuberculin skin tests of her husband and her physician, who were both HIV negative, converted from negative to positive. They were treated with pyrazinamide and desambutol and are apparently cured. The dramatic difference in the course of the two infected HIV negative contacts who remained asymptomatic and in the AIDS patient who died shows the importance of an intact immune system for the defense against MTB. We might also reflect on how different the outcome would be today with highly active antiretroviral therapy and the bedaquiline pretonamid linozolid combination for drug resistant TB. Let's now turn to post primary HIV associated tuberculosis. Typically, but not exclusively, post primary HIV TB is generalized with fever and adenopathies, in particular mediastinal, and positive blood cultures, 
This graph illustrates the differences between TB without on the left and with on the right HIV. Without HIV, most cases of TB are limited to the lung, but that is emphatically not true if TB is combined with HIV. Case number two illustrates mediastinal lymphadenopathies, fever, and positive blood cultures. In a 26-year-old man, note the widening of the upper mediastinum. Here is another similar case with MTB isolated from a supraclavicular lymph node. The large paraortic lymph nodes are particularly visible in the CT scan. This patient also presented with weight loss fever and cough. Note the widening of the heli and the reticulonodular infiltrate. It is hard to say whether this is lymph node or miliary tuberculosis. Some statistics about patients with pulmonary TB regarding the differences between HIV positive versus HIV negatives. Cavities are more frequent in HIV negatives, but miliary TB, primary progressive TB, and normal chest X-ray, probably on the way to miliary TB with positive blood cultures, are clearly more frequent in HIV positives. The next case is a seeming exception to these kind of rules. He was immunosuppressed, he had typical symptoms, and sputum with acid-fast bacteria. His chest x-ray showed typical infiltrates in the right upper lobe. And in this uh, CT image, there is a thick walled cavity in the right lung apex. This looked like a typical case of pulmonary post-primary TB in an HIV negative, but the patient also had abdominal pain. There was a question of laparoscopy and he finally got a biopsy of an abdominal lymph node, which showed acid-fast bacteria, and he had positive blood cultures. After four months of anti-TB treatment, the upper lobe infiltrate had almost disappeared. A few months later, however, his fever came back. His chest X-ray was normal. But when it was repeated because of increasing dyspnea a couple of weeks later, there was a diffuse reticulonodular infiltrate. Bronchoscopy showed abundant pneumocystis carini. This patient illustrates a sad reality in those days. One might have success with treatment of one infection, here it was TB, but the patient succumbed a few months later to another. In San Francisco during the late 1980s, the median survival of co-infected patients HIV TB was only 16 months. In some patients, TB flares up or becomes apparent shortly after the start of antiretroviral therapy while CD4 counts rise. This flare-up is called immune reconstitution inflammatory 
syndrome or iris. It is particularly frequent with mycobacterial diseases. Patient 6 was born in 1963, probably infected by IV drug use. In 2003, she had fever and weight loss. She was admitted to the hospital, only f weighing only 42 kilograms, highly febrile, with swollen supraclavicular lymph nodes. The CD4 count was 54 and the viremia elevated. Chest X-ray and CT showed multiple enlarged lymph nodes. Routine blood cultures, urinalysis, tuberculin skin reactions were all negative, but the sputum and the lymph node aspirates showed abundant acid fast rods. This is a CT scan just before start of anti-tuberculosis treatment showing enlarged paratracheal lymph nodes. Acid fast bacteria were seen in the lymph node aspirate and culture revealed mycobacterium tuberculosis sensitive to all TB drugs tested. Following guidelines current at that time, anti-tuberculous treatment with four drugs was started on February 4th, 2003 with vitamin B6 and cotrimoxazole to prevent PCP, but heart was withheld. End of April, the viral load had risen further to more than 1 million and the CD4 count declined to 45. On May 2nd, 2003, heart was started with nelfinavir, tenofovir and lamivudine. Remember, anti-TB treatment was started in February and heart in May. But in June and July of 2006, she didn't feel better because she had fever and continued weight loss. Fluctuating cervical lymph nodes yielded pus with one plus acid fast rods. Here is a CT scan from July 8th. Note the massively enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes and compare to the image on the left from before the start of heart. Lymph adenopathy and liquefaction is also evident in the coronal section. Under continued anti-TB therapy plus heart, the enlarged lymph nodes gradually disappeared and were no longer visible at the end of anti-TB therapy on November 9th, 2003. Note that anti-TB treatment started in February, while heart started in May. In case of iris, it is typical to see acid fast bacteria while the cultures remain negative. This is a summary of case one. On the left, a CT scan before start of all therapy. In the middle, the CT scan after two months of heart plus anti-TB treatment. On the right, the appearance at the end of anti-TB treatment. With an increase in CD4 cells between the start of heart and two months later from 54 to 213. Immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome or iris is more fully treated in another video of this series. Here is the link. In countries where TB is frequent, the combination of HIV and TB occurs in many children.
This was a nine-year-old HIV-infected girl with fever for six weeks prior to admission, lymph adenopathy, anemia, and mild abdominal distension, and an enlarged liver and spleen. The chest X-ray showed perihilar and peripheral infiltrates. The abdominal CT was typical for tuberculosis with necrotic and calcified lymph nodes and a thickening of the cecum and of the terminal ileum. Respiratory failure due to ARDS ensued and the patient died. Findings at autopsy were typical of TB with abundant granulomas in the lung containing acid fast bacteria and giant cells. <clears throat> CNS involvement and particularly meningitis is also more frequent in TB HIV co-infected patients than in HIV negatives. Case 8 was a middle-aged IV drug user found unresponsive in a squat. He had a presumed overdose but remained confused after treatment with naloxone. He was also febrile at 39 degrees and immunosuppressed with only 48 CD4 cells per microliter. Lumbar puncture yielded 1.5 grams per liter of protein, 350 mononuclear cells per microliter. Gram and acid fast stains were negative, but the culture grew MTB after 13 days. The blood culture was also positive five days later. We were unable to obtain a good quality CT scan because of the patient's confusion. So this is an illustrative image from another published case showing leptomeningeal enhancement. Case 9 was a 36-year-old African being treated for INH-resistant pulmonary TB. He had a seizure. He was HIV positive with 118 CD4 cells, a viremia of 100,000 copies per ml, and his toxoplasma serology was negative. He had no IgG antibodies. The CT scan showed a hyperdense, contrast-enhanced right parieto-occipital lesion with very slight mass effect. The perilesional edema is particularly evident in the MRI scan. Such a finding opens up quite a large differential diagnosis. Toxoplasmosis and syphilis are unlikely because the serologists were negative. A pyogenic abscess would likely cause fever and neutrophilia with left shift. Against cryptococcosis is the absence of fever and meningitis. Aspergillosis, well, the immunosuppression is not sufficiently advanced and he had not received prior steroids. Lymphoma is a possibility, although it usually occurs in patients with less than 50 CD4 cells. And finally, tuberculosis. The diagnosis was established by brain biopsy. The neurosurgeon found necrotic tissue 
with some neutrophils and mononuclear cells, Fram stain was negative, but the acid fast stain and the oramine stain revealed likely MTB confirmed by culture. Tuberculous abscesses must be distinguished from tuberculoma. An abscess is usually unique, polylobulated, has a hypodense center with peripheral contrast enhancement and edema with mass effect. In contrast, tuberculomas are usually multiple, round, small, and have less or no edema or mass effect. Thank you for watching. I'd be grateful for any feedback. This video is part of a series on opportunistic diseases in HIV AIDS. Please subscribe.